Welcome everyone to the Texas Children and Nature Network webinar promoting outdoor time in schools through Shacks. My name is Sarah Coles and I'm the Executive Director of Texas Children and Nature Network and we're excited to have you with us today. We are recording our session today. Once again, thank you for joining us. To save bandwidth for all of our attendees and for a clean recording, we ask everyone to turn off their cameras and mute themselves during the presentation. I'll be monitoring the chat. So can, you can share your questions there and I'll share them with our presenters. Melody Alcazar is running tech for us today. Thank you, Melody. As I said, we're recording today's session. Alice will share the recording in a follow-up email in the coming days. If you are uncomfortable with your name showing, you can change your name to anonymous and private message Melody with your name for our attendance. Also, if your Zoom name doesn't match the name you registered with, please change your name or let Melody know. And you can change your name by hovering over your name and you'll see three little dots pop up. You can click that and you can click change name. If you are needing a certificate, you will need to email the address provided in the Zoom link email at the end of this workshop to get that, work that certificate. I'm gonna go ahead and do our land acknowledgement. Texas Children and Nature Network is headquartered in Austin. And as such, I'm on the ancestral and unceded land of the Tonkawa, Comanche, and Sana people. Our ongoing colonial presence on indigenous lands compels us to take action now to counteract the effects of colonization. The work we do through the Texas Children in Nature Network is one small step towards that effort. I'll put some links in the chat about land acknowledgements in just a moment. And also our next webinar on November 1st is all about land acknowledgements and how we can work to move past uh, the acknowledgement part to some greater change. Um, so I'll put that link in the chat as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers now. Uh, Michelle Smith is with Action for Healthy Kids and Alice Kirk is with AgriLife. They have been working for a long time with school health advisory committees uh, to improve the health of our school kids. Thank you so much for presenting today, Alice and Michelle, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Sarah. We're, we're excited to be here. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Children in Nature does a lot of very important work, um, and we're really excited to be able to share some of the experiences and knowledge we've gained around school health and school health advisory councils. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Michelle Smith. I'm the uh, Interim Supervisor and Family School Partnership Programs for Action for Healthy Kids. And joining me today is our volunteer chair for Texas Action for Healthy Kids, Alice Kirk. Alice, you want to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, welcome, everyone. And as Michelle said, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I am with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, uh, based out of the College Station area. However, um, in my role as a state child health and wellness specialist, have the, the beauty of working with counties all across the state. So Extension is fortunate to have agents in all 254 Texas counties. Um, so we're excited to be here. Alice is, makes our work, extends our work. I am the only person from Action for Healthy Kids in Texas. So without Alice and a lot of the other organizations that we partner with, our work would be pretty limited. So we are really excited that we are able to partner with so many great organizations. Oh, let's see. There we go. Oops. Well, what do we skip? It's skipping slides for me. That's nice. <laughs> Just a little bit about uh, who Action Healthy Kids is. We've been around since 2002 when Dr. David Satcher, who was the Surgeon General, declared that we had an obesity epidemic. And they pulled together teams from every state in the U.S. to strategize how we could have an impact through schools on our children's health. And in Texas, we uh, did. We took it very seriously. We put together a team. We still have some of the original members from. Uh, 2002 participating with us. And we've done a lot of work around nutrition policy, recess, physical education, um, provided grants and workshops on wellness policies across the state. So uh, we're really excited that this organization is still here and that we're able to do this kind of work. I know we're preaching to the choir, but I did want to include some of the key points that have been made around the impact of being outside on child health and how it relates to their academic success. Um, as I think Sarah mentioned, we will provide you these slides just in case you have an opportunity 
where you can connect with the district and you want to share some of this information. And a lot of it came from uh, an article that relates back to uh, this very specific topic around child health and how nature impacts it. So um, nature can restore children's attention, which is very important when you're talking about elementary school kids. Having a walk in the park or a walk around the track or just being outside or having windows can help restore children's attention and help them concentrate and even do better on tests. Um, one of the studies that was cited uh, randomly assigned students to take science lessons either in the classroom or in a garden, school garden, and they found that the lessons that were uh, out in the garden were more effective for learning and that the more time they spent in the garden, uh, the greater the gains the children had. Nature can help relieve children's stress. I know a lot of our schools are dealing with uh, since the pandemic, children are still challenged to recover from stress that they have. Um, they are less stressed when they have green spaces to retreat to. If they can get outside, if they have a place to play outside during the day, it's going to be a lot easier for them to calm, be calmer, and have more uh, attention to their lessons. Uh, the study that's cited here looked at children in rural environments and those that had more nature nearby recovered better from stressful life events uh, in terms of their self-worth and their stress. So nature has additional benefits as well. Um, nature can help children develop more self-discipline. Uh, outdoor instruction makes students more engaged and interested. A time outside can increase physical activity, which is gonna help them be uh, healthier and nature settings may promote social connections and creativity. So these are all things that we feel need to be shared out with schools and parents so that they understand the impact that being outside and that nature can have on their kids' success in school. Um, so we need parents to be able to advocate for recess for time outside and help educate district and school staff about the importance of outdoor play. These are some of the challenges that our schools and our districts and our teachers face. Um, there's such a, such a strong emphasis on academic success, particularly now. The learning loss that um, is attributed to the pandemic has all schools concerned about being uh, great rated and how they're going to keep grades up or get grades up. Um, Houston you know, was taken over. Austin is having some serious challenges. So um, there is more emphasis than ever on academic success. And when that happens, they start taking away things like art, music, um, physical activity. So it's, it's important that we go back and we have people, parents and community members that can share why it's important not to do that. Um, teachers have so many requirements and paperwork that they don't have time to uh, do as much advocating as they might want to. Plus it's their job and who wants to go in and argue with their boss every day. So these are things that have really challenged uh, our schools and our districts and our parents. Um, we have seen physical activity cut for tutoring and test prep and it's really concerning and we, we are hoping that we can share information with you around schools advisory councils, which we feel are one of the best ways to make a difference within a school district. Um, these are just a few more th things that uh, we feel are important to let people know or include when you're sharing information about the importance of being outside and having some policies in place that support children being active. Um, the main reason is kids spend more time in school than they do at home while they're awake. Um, so they definitely need to be active. They need that they have to have that environment that supports child health to be able to learn and grow. Um, teachers have told us uh, they want kids to be outside. They want kids to have recess, but sometimes the principals are the ones that aren't supportive. So um, we've done things like, you know, get the teachers union involved in promoting recess. Um, so there's things that we feel need to be shared. And a lot of times the school health advisory council is the best way. Um, and then a lot of times I, we've also found that parents aren't even aware that their kids aren't getting outside time or recess. 
And when they find out, they're just like, what? This can't be true. So we're going to share more about shacks and how they can uh, be used. And these are, like I said, just some little tidbits that we feel you might want to build in any kind of presentation you're making to parents or to teachers. And I'm going to turn it over to Alice. All right. Thanks, Michelle. So, um, you know, let's let's start off by again. And we realize we may be teaching a little bit to the choir, but if this is a refresher for you, it's always a good idea to to um, just get a, a refresher. So exactly what is a shack? Um, and we know that a shack is actually a district level advisory council. So school health advisory council and and really its purpose is to assist the district in ensuring that the community values, the local values are being reflected in the district's um, health instruction, um, you know, whatever that looks like. And um, the beauty of shacks is that Ideally, if it really is representative of an area, of a, of a, it's going to encompass and should possess um, people from within the community that are part of that shack. And I think that's where Michelle and I were excited um, to have the invitation from Sarah to come and talk to um, this group in particular about shacks to just a little bit of awareness and then hopefully give y'all a couple of tips and ways that you can actually get involved um, with your shacks. Next slide. So exactly what is a shack? So shacks are actually mandated by state law. Um, they are a shack member is is to be appointed by the school board or at least approved by the school board. Um, and and the school health advisory councils are also really the place for parents and the community to have a voice where they can provide input to ensure that um, the student's health um, and their wellness and the school environment in general is supportive of the educational learning. Um, and in addition to that, Shacks are responsible for reviewing certain components um, within the school um, curriculum, including the health curriculum, any of the health related curriculums. And then also they have a really important job of helping make recommendations on a variety of health topics. Because um, again, as a parent or a community leader, you may be looking out into the um, you know, surroundings and seeing certain issues becoming an area, uh, a, a problem or an issue that, um, you know, the school environment, because as Michelle said, um, our kids are spending a majority of their time in the school system, um, you know, can at least begin to um, address and, and have a role in that conversation along with parents and the community. Um, next slide. So, um, shacks and in, in, uh, really take to heart the whole idea of the WISC model. So you may hear Michelle and I reference the WISC model um, throughout this, the rest of the presentation. The WISC model stands for the whole school, whole community, whole child. And really, it is an extension of the coordinated school health model. And what it does is this particular model incorporates the components of a really effective school health programs and the tenets of the whole child approach to education. It's really this model in particular, it addresses the symbiotic relationship between learning and health. So as you look at this model, you see that there is every facet of what a um, student, a child um, would really kind of be looking for and or need in their overall development. It's, it's very holistic in its approach. And it focuses on the traditional coordinated school health approach, but it also aligns with the structure and the framework of including 
community, um, family, and it just takes a, a broader approach in the fact that we all have a role to play um, in um, how we impact the, the totality of the development of a child. Next slide. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later um, in uh, about the model as well. Um, so let's talk about who are the members for a shack. Okay, so over fifty percent. So a, a, a majority, not you know, hopefully fifty one percent of your shacks should be uh, parents and parents that are not employed by the district. And this is where there's so much value. Um, we often have this conversation in that um, having parents who can have a voice um, without fear of any repercussions because they are employed by the school district is really important because that way we ensure that um, maybe some difficult topics can be brought to light from a parent's perspective. Um, here you see a list of not only the parents, but other members um, in a, any community setting that would be great to consider being a part of a school health advisory council. And this includes every one of you that is on today's um, uh, training, uh, because any one of us can find a place where we fit into this role, whether we're um, an, a, a nonprofit agency, an educational agency, as myself from AM, um, you know, just um, th there's a place for, for everyone, really. Um, but what's important is that um, you also look, and as you, you see this list, um, one of the lists on here is having a school board member. Um, Michelle and I have found over the years, oh my goodness, the value of having someone from a school board serving or attending at least visiting as a part of some of your shack meetings is really important because they get to hear the conversation and in many ways can help share that knowledge, that dialogue um, with, with counterparts. Um, and, and it's just a good, um, good way to ensure that um, everyone uh, from school board members to teachers to principals, to parents, to community le leaders, um, truthfully feel that they have a voice and that they can all play a role and have some value in sharing resources um, and, and can really help your shack be successful overall. So next slide. Why do we need shacks? <clears throat> we hear that question also. Um, you know, is a shack really necessary? Um, we would argue yes. Um, the school health advisory councils really um, more and more have become an essential part of um, our our child's development. All of our kids. Um, there are so many risks out and so many issues that our children are facing, um, and so many of them really have to do with behaviors um, and choices. And since our kids do spend a majority of their days at school, um, it's really important for us to recognize and to support the more healthful behaviors that are going to ensure you know safe and healthy learning environments. And that's what shacks do. Um, and so the shacks are really that connection between the schools, um, the community, the parents, and the district in all matters related to health and wellness. Um, and, you know, Michelle noted this earlier. Um, so many of our school staff can just be overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day part of, um, of classroom instruction that um, thinking about how a child's health and wellness, whether that's social or emotional um, learning is happening, sometimes it gets ignored. So shacks can really make things happen um, and, and they can be that voice and have an impact in, in the ability to, to get our kids um, really started and continuing to go down the right leg with, you know, things like 
ensuring they have adequate physical activity, that they're having really nutritious lunches, um, that they have the opportunity to go outside on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> all of those components um, are places where shacks and the district policies can kind of come together to ensure that they're reflecting uh, parent and community values and that their guiding policies are really what we want um, to set up our kids for the most success um, and, and find ways that we can impact the health of all our kids. And so um, shacks are important because they also um, bring focus um, to the, the role that learn, the learning environment has. They, as I noted earlier, they really surprise the the whole child approach, the whole child motto. So you're not just sending a brain to school, right? We all know, I know when I send my kids off to school every day, um, it's, it's not just a brain walking out the door. Um, they're a, a teenager, they're, uh, you know, filled with all kinds of of um, uh, emotions, and, and so it's a whole child. And so when you send that child out the door, you want them to, to be as healthy as they can be and as as ready and prepared um, to to garner and and be productive and um, and make um, their educational goals uh, a reality. So shacks help bring focus to the whole child education. Um, they support districts. They encourage parent involvement. Um, as much as we can. Um, they support schools and they really help drive the policies around all things health and wellness. And I think that last bullet in particular, as you see here, it's really great because they uh, shacks are a way to kind of push school districts to look around their environment and utilize the community resources and the assets that parents and community organizations and groups like Children in Nature can bring to the table. And that's really important. Okay, so we're going to talk in a, in a few minutes a little bit more about what your role could be um, moving forward in the shacks. But before we get started, Michelle and I always like to do this little um, activity here, um, because first and foremost, you know, I mentioned that shacks are mandated, um, but um, exactly what is the law in Texas related to shacks? So this is going to be a quick quiz that we're going to start um, that we use for shack workshops, and we're going to see if we can kind of make it work here um, today um, virtually. So the first question is, what is the law? Okay, so these are all in the form of a true false. Okay, so <clears throat> true false um, chair or co chair must be a parent. All right, let's see. Yeah, drop that into the chat. Yes, I wanted oh, perfect. I was about to say that. Yeah. Okay, Michelle, you can hit Answer the it. response. Ready? It's like everybody knows this one. It is. Uh, yeah. True. Yes. There was a, a time when um, there was a lot of challenges that the shacks were being run by district personnel, and so they weren't able to accomplish anything. So we went back to the legislator and said, what can we do? Let's make it a chair or co-chair must be a parent. That way, there was always a parent voice that could be heard and not just a district staff if that was a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is absolutely true. Okay, the next one. Now, shacks are required for each individual campus. Okay, drop it in the box. Is that true or false? Okay, these guys must have gotten advance notice. Oh, these are some smarties. That's correct. Yeah. It is not a campus level requirement. It is a district requirement. Uh, we recommend that each campus have a wellness team, uh, but it's not required that they have one of those. Very good. Next question. Shacks must report to the school board at least once annually. True. Oh, look at these guys. No, no, I, nobody's missed anything. Wow, they are at 100% 100, 100 right now. We, we definitely recommend, if at all possible, that Shacks 
be in front of the school board once a year uh, because they have so much they deal with. If a report goes in, may or may not be read. And if you can get even 15 minutes in front of a school board, you can share who you are, what you're doing, and make a huge difference in their uh, awareness of what's going on with SHACs. Perfect. All right, next question. That SHACs must meet at least four times annually, quarterly, at a minimum. Is that true or false? Ah, look at that. It's true. It uh, we didn't want it to be burdensome, but we felt like in some cases there were districts that were only meeting once a year. And you really can't do anything if you're only meeting once a year. So uh, four times a year is mandated. And then subcommittees can meet in between times. And a lot of the districts meet every month. So uh, it's it's really encouraging. Yeah, and uh, we'll be honest, uh, I think some of the most effective shacks that uh, we've that I personally have been a part of or been able to support um, are those that are meeting usually monthly or at least every other month. Okay, next question. Shacks must be comprised of at least five members appointed by the school board. True or false? Whoops. Well, I cheated. Sorry. <laughs> I touched it and it came up. Uh, this, this again, for smaller districts, it's really challenging to get uh, a group of people. So we tried to make it reasonable and have five members. So you need at least that many to be able to discuss. We know we've talked to some of the smaller districts that have kind of combined and maybe had a shack within two districts so that they can share knowledge and information. Uh, but the key on this one is having them appointed by the school board so that the superintendent is not always in charge of who's on the shack, because uh, that was a lot of times what was happening. So they don't have to find the members. Um, a shack can bring a list to the school board and say, we'd like you to appoint these people, but they are supposed to approve and appoint uh, the members for the shack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and we completely um, support um, the current SHAC members if they're going to be coming off, as Michelle said, to maybe seek some of those parents or others who really have a vested interest and and um, you know nominate them or take their names before the board. All right, the majority of the members must be staff employed by the school district. Ah, oh, look at that. Oops. True. That is false, correct, uh -huh. not true. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, again, this was a case of, we had, a, it's not that there should, uh, teachers who are parents and other staff who are parents need to belong to the shack as well, but having parents that weren't obligated to the district be the majority just made it easier to have a strong voice. Um, we had a lot of district people that wanted to make changes happen, but they couldn't get anywhere because you know they were concerned about going against you know the superintendent or the, or others. So having those parent members that were not employed by the school district is definitely important. Mm -hmm. And that is where community members um, like yourselves um, who live in the community, maybe you have a child attending the school, uh, but you're not yourself employed by the school. That's where there's so much value in the opportunity like we have today to visit with you and others um, about shacks. Um, okay, true, false. Shack recommendations must be considered by the superintendent before changing the district's curriculum. True or false? Mm. This one's got a mix of answers. I was going to say, so this is the first one. Yeah. So shacks are advisory committees and they put together their recommendations and their recommendations are for the board consideration. So the super, our position is you should take them to the superintendent, the executive committee first, because if they aren't on board with them, it's gonna be very challenging to have anything implemented. So all the shacks I've worked with usually go through the superintendent, but if you really feel strongly that something needs to happen, there's no recess, going on, um, the shack can go directly to the board mm -hmm. and take the recommendations. Um, same thing on curriculum. The shack should not 
have to uh, not put their information in front of the board if even if the superintendent doesn't agree with it. So it's it's not that the superintendent shouldn't or doesn't have to consider the curriculum changes, but it's the board that really makes that final decision. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, outside of whether the superintendent is necessarily um, in favor. And so, yes, that again, that is one of the values of having a shack. Okay, Michelle, I think I'm going to let you yeah. take the next. So one. these are some of the other areas, just so that you know where shacks provide guidance on policies. Um, one of the ones that's most contentious is the number of around health education, uh, all health education changes have to go through the shack and some new rules were put in place, not this last session, but the one before about how that was to be done. And it's, it's still challenging some districts. I think we've had three or four webinars about it and people are still confused, but uh, also policies and procedures and curriculum around pro obesity prevention, um, joint use agreements to try to encourage especially in the smaller communities, uh, schools to share their uh, facilities. When you're in a small town and there's no place for the kids to play and the school has all this space, uh, you know, they really need to be able to working together. So trying to find ways to encourage uh, schools and districts collaborating. And then uh, there is a law that says that shacks will review and make recommendations around recess. Um, they should review existing research, which is where some of the information we shared earlier should come in. The importance of outdoor play so that when they're looking at changing a recess policy, they can put something in there that encourages children to be outside, if at all possible, um, during their playtime. There's also a mandate that physical activity and fitness subcommittee exists. Um, so again, this is a place where you know, uh, members that are concerned about kids being outside could be part of this subcommittee. It's supposed to help the district find ways to keep kids active during the school day and look at different issues relating to physical activity and fitness that are going on at the district or at the school level. So they also make policy recommendations on how to increase physical activity and improve fitness among students. So I, when I read this, I was just, you know, really sad hearing that a fourth grader wants to play inside because that's where the electrical outlets are located just kind of breaks my heart. You know, we have got to do a better job of engaging our youth in activities that encourage them to be outside and to be active. But parents themselves can't do it all by themselves. That's why it is so important that we have these school health advisory committees, that we have the support of the community and of organizations like Children in Nature. And you know, having the experts and the resources that can share information that can help convince a school board or a school administrator how important it is that having kids play outside is to their health and their academic success. Uh, one parent can go into a principal and nothing happens. Two parents and the principal listens couple of parents and some community members, and the next thing you know, things start changing. So it's really important uh, that we involve the community and we, we educate and engage parents and our school districts in this and make sure they understand it's not just about being physically active, it's also about being outside. Mm -hmm. So off, off my soapbox now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of policies can uh, Texas Children and Nature members support through a shack? Uh, we've talked a lot about recess, having active outdoor recess, finding ways to make it easier for kids to be outside. Uh, one of the things we did in Austin when I was on the shack there was we got um, covers for all of the blacktops at each elementary school so that in when it was hot in the, in the early months of end of school or beginning of school, um, kids could still go outside and play because they had a shaded area to go to. Um, encouraging school gardens is another area where uh, a lot of schools have embraced school gardens, and this helps educate kids about where foods come from, helps keep them active. There are so many reasons that school gardens are 
important. And if we can get uh, schools and districts to embrace those, it can do a lot. So I'm going to turn this back to Alice, who's going to share uh, a little bit about how some of the shacks and the schools that she's worked with have been successful. So uh -huh. Alice? Yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, as Michelle and I were talking about, you know, today's presentation, we thought, you know, we wanted to share a, a, at least one or two little success stories. And, um, you know, these, um, this county that I'm going to share with y'all about is, is, is Star County down in South Texas, um, right along the Texas-Mexico border. And, uh, you know, years ago, we were fortunate to have some initial funding um, from CDC that was aimed at supporting access for food and physical activity in underserved rural areas. Um, and it was then that we started looking around and thinking, you know, uh, so how do we begin to pull together groups for this particular project? And obviously schools, especially in rural areas, is one of the places where we felt it would be a good place to start. Um, and interestingly, in this particular county, we found that they had three school districts and three school districts that were quite varied. There was one very small rural school district that had, you know, less than 200 kids. And we had a kind of a medium sized school district for the county that had somewhere around 5,000 kids. And then we had a larger school district that, um, you know, had close to about 10,000 kids by the time the project had ended. Now, what was interesting was as we started looking and working with the schools, we realized some schools had a shack, others didn't know what a shack was, <laughs> and uh, the third school had a shack, but maybe wasn't really utilizing them to their fullest. So, um, you know, we thought, well, hey, why don't we start looking at shacks and taking um, a look at what the power of the shack could do to implement some policy changes and, and change the school environment to support more, not only what was in line with this particular grant project, but also what we knew from the WISC model and from just other research um, that we're aware of that, that could maybe impact um, their, their educational um, goals as well as their overall health. Next slide. So what we did was um, kind of going back to, to one of Michelle's comments a little while ago, um, you know, kids uh, and going back to some of the one of the research points that she mentioned earlier re related to um, science classes and the study finding effectiveness, you know, which kids are going to be most effective, those that are learning science in school versus those that are outside in a garden, um, you know, actually in outside in nature, using their hands, journaling outside, etc. And so with the support of Shack, so we were, we really started by building up our Shack group. And what we found um, was that um, there were lots of people in the community that would have an interest in supporting the school, but they'd never been invited to attend a meeting or they didn't know how to get started or um, you know that that there was even an interest in some of the skill set that they had. So what we did was um, through the project we were able to implement 14 outdoor classrooms or gardens and we really brought in, as you can see on the pictures here, a whole variety of people that had a love of nature, a love of being outside and gardening, um, a hobby or an interest, or maybe when they were a child, they worked, you know, but regardless, it was such a value to bring all of these people with all of these skills together. And what that resulted in was these 14 gardens um, being able to, to grow around 28,000 pounds of produce a year for the schools to utilize. Um, and not only were the schools able to utilize 
within their salad bars, um, they were able to provide some good nutrition for families. And then what wasn't um, taken by families was also uh, provided to the food pantries. Next slide. Oops. Oh. From that, um, uh, again, as a, as a part of food access, um, what we also found was that this group and, and this county, through the help of a parent volunteer, um, parents that, again, had never really felt like they had much to offer to the school, but as they learned more and more about Shucks, they were like, hey, I live here in this community. Um, you know, my, my children have graduated. I don't have a child in school anymore. However, you know, I am a local farmer and I would love to work with this project and help get, you know, the produce that's being uh, grown into a mobile market and we can take it out to some more far reaching areas of the county um, where maybe it's hard for them to get to a grocery store store. Um, you know, for one of the communities, it was an hour and a half drive to get to the closest, you know, uh, HEB or Walmart. And so um, through the help of SHAC members, you know, not only this one parent, uh, and he's down the gentleman in the, the middle picture, um, not only through his efforts, he and um, his wife were, you know, initially able to start it, but by the time the project ended, there was sustainability because they had established a business model using some of the high school kids, um, working, you know, with their agriculture agent and their agriculture school programs. Um, it was just a way to change the overall environment of that county, of those schools, and give kids an idea and a way of thinking about a future um, that even if it was gardening for a hobby, um, it was still changing their overall um, desire to want to be outside. And the kids would clamor and teachers all of the teachers in grade levels, um, whether it was English teachers, math teachers, social studies, science teachers, they all found ways to incorporate more of their activities, more of their lesson plans outside. It became literally outside classrooms for, for a number of the teachers. Next um, slide. Um, the project, and again, the project because of the shack and because of these parents coming together, um, again, they realized that they had so many untapped resources. Um, Michelle mentioned earlier about how when she was on the shack at, at Austin ISD, they were able to put, you know, the covered um, uh coverings over a lot of the black tops or the playscapes. Well, one of the things that this community was dealing with, or one of the communities that we were working with, is that they have such high winds that go through um, some of those areas that they had tried and tried and tried with some of the coverings, but they never lasted very long. Um, what they really needed because of the extreme heat that they have down in the valley, and the fact that a lot of parents would take their kids or want to take their kids out to play was going to be after dark, but there was no lighting in a lot of these parks and it was a little scary. So, you know, the grant listened to the parents and the community members that were coming to the meetings, um, meeting on a regular basis, and through their work, they were able to make improvements and get volunteers um, to put in playscapes, um, create, you know, a place for the kids to walk and run, do some trails, and then provide that lighting where kids and parents would be able to go outside and enjoy nature and, you know, look up at the stars and, and be out um, during cool evenings um, playing with, with their kids um, in a safe environment. And so you can see that before and after um, the community and the shack had a tremendous role in changing the landscape and the environment of their community. Next slide. 
So this is um, my, my last slide, I believe, related to this is that ultimately what really was exciting about the school support and the community and parental support is that there was a tremendous amount of sustainability that resulted um, because it wasn't just uh, us coming in with a, a pot of money that sometimes it you know happens as as schools receive grants um you know the money is there they get things done but then as soon as the money is gone who's really taking ownership who's really got a vested interest in keeping the project going keeping the goals going and what we found is that till today um there are still tremendous amount of work going on in those communities because of the policies that were just implemented. Um, as Michelle noted, joint use agreements, um, because of the shacks knew that in so many of these areas, rural areas, um, kids didn't really have playscapes. You know, they could go out and run in their field, which was great. And many of them, you know, could do all kinds of games and tags and so forth. However, um, you know, it was also nice that they could go to a school after hours and let their kids play on a playground, um, be able to go and participate in garden work days on the weekends or on an evening, et cetera. So that those, those school relationships that started with the shacks led to um, that shared joint use agreements between community members um, utilizing um, school grounds. And then also um, garden to cafeteria. Um, I always love this picture because all the produce that you see is um, everything that came out of the garden that particular day when they harvested. And so, you know, the working with the um, nutrition um, school dietitian and, and food service managers, et cetera, they were able to implement a policy and support so that kids during lunchtime were actually tasting um, the fruits of their labor, literally, um, that they had had such a great time being outside, um, helping be a part of that, of the growing of their own food. And so again, being out in nature, the beauty of that. Okay, um, I am going to pause and turn things back over to Michelle so that she can go a little further into detail about, you know, uh, similar to, you know, a question that many that we hear often is, how do I even find out about my shack? So real quickly, and then we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. So if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat and Sarah will share them with us. Um, you know, we, we, we hope that we've inspired you enough, if you aren't a member of a shack, that you'll consider joining a shack. And what I have here are some links to uh, Texas Education Agency information. Um, you can click on these links or use the QR code, put in your address, and it will tell you what schools are close by, and then you can find out what district. And then once you find that, there's just two different options here for how you can do that. And it'll also give you grades on the schools. Um, then you can check the district website. So if you Google Austin ISD Shack, it will take you directly to their Shack page. Every district is supposed to have a page on their website where they post the minutes from their meetings, where they share information about uh, when their meetings are being held, where they're being held, so that you have an opportunity to go. You don't have to be a member to attend a SHAC meeting. You can just go sit in and listen and find out what they're talking about. Um, see if you can connect with a couple of people who are there and ask, what are y'all's main focus areas? What are you working on? How could I be helpful? But, you know, it's not hard. You just need to know where to start and start with that link. We'll share that with you. And then um, like I said, Google, Google the school district. If you have any trouble at all, uh, you can reach out to me. Our contact information will also be part of this presentation as well. Um, so we hope that what we've shared has helped you understand a little bit more about shacks and what the laws are and how they work. Uh, it's a lot to try to cover in an hour. So we're, we've given you as, as much as we've, we could as quickly as we can. Um, 
then we hope that it's it's you find it's useful. There is one other place I will share, but before we do that, I um, wanted to see if we had any questions. We have a question. Is there is there a minimum requirement for meeting minutes? Or, or how many minutes do meetings need to be? Sorry, that's the... Yeah, that's, that's up to individual districts. It's required that they have four meetings per year. But as far as how long those meetings last, um, that's up to each district. There's there's not a, a law on that one. Uh, you know, I don't know, Alice, how much, how long do y'all's last? Ours usually lasted two hours. Yeah, I was going to say, so I am the co-chair. I am the parent representative co-chair on my son's um, and our school district's um, shack. Um, we typically meet about an hour and a half um, and then oftentimes our subcommittees might meet an extra 30 or 45 minutes together off in, you know, one, you know, one corner of the room or something. Um, I don't believe that there's actually a limit for that. However, what is required um, as far as a, a minimum is that there must be a recording of the minutes available and posted on the website. Uh, so, um, for us and our school district, um, we only do an audio recording of all of the minutes. Um, some do a video recording as well and post it. Um, we're in a small rural school district, and so um, we do we do a recording. But you can go to our our site uh, in our school district and find all of our recordings, and then we also have a transcription available. So we have both, and they're typically posted. Um, gosh, we try to post ours. Um, usually within the next 24 hours after our, we have met. We try to be quick about that. Somebody asked if there was a, a length of time you have to keep the records. That has not been mandated by law. That is something that your district and your shack can set um, how long you feel they should be kept. Uh, so, I think it, yeah. Michelle, I was going to say, so in our school district, we actually worked with our, um, like our legal person to, to identify. And I have heard of other school districts who have also met with whoever their legal or HR or whatever person, they have determined how long um, they're, they're going to keep and post um, the, the minutes and so forth. That's a, Vanessa has a good question. Um, I have to give that one some thought. Are there any changes to policy around how shocks operate that you all think would help make a greater impact for schools? Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest challenge we have, Vanessa, is that there's no monetary support and there's no accountability for shacks. So we have all these mandates, we have all these requirements, but nobody polices it. Um, there's the only thing that is ever even looked at are wellness policies. And those are reviewed uh, by the Department of Agriculture when they're reviewing things for the school meal program. So um, having some type of accountability uh, for the shacks at the district level would be great if your district had shacks report back to the, the district advisory committee or had some type of accountability would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Michelle, I saw a question pop up related to what was that? Um, uh, what was that last one? Oh, sorry, I, I, it's gone from my screen. <laughs> we've got. I'll I'll read out a few. Okay, uh, perfect. We've got one. How do you get involved in a shack that will not respond to a request? Oh well, you send me an email. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, please. <laughs> and we'll we'll do some investigating. Yes, I, you know, because I have helped other you know mm -hmm. people that that their shacks are not responding or they don't have a shack in place. Yes, um, we have actually worked with individuals to try to help fix that problem. Absolutely, and uh, I was going to say the same thing. We've we've worked, yeah. Oh, I, that's what the question was about Zoom. Absolutely. So during COVID, we, um, many of us, uh, began meeting via Zoom. Um, and obviously post-COVID, um, I know Michelle and I have both talked to school districts who um, some continue meeting periodically, 
Um, so if out of the four meetings that are required, two of them may be via Zoom virtually, um, and then the other two are face-to-face, -face, um, that has worked well, um, I think, because it's a good idea for there to be some face-to-face -face interactions, um, especially, you know, if there's a hot topic or, you know, something that's going to be really um of interest for a lot of people to actually go and, and have a voice. But um, yeah, we have heard that some um, continue having success with Zoom meetings. And we've got another kind of comment slash question from Jennifer. It would be nice to have a training on what all is required to go through the shacks and what is provided to what grade levels yearly. So I'm going to show you this information real quickly. Um, we have established this during the pandemic at the Texas Shack Network, which you can join. You can go to txshacknetwork.org, and okay. it has a lot of the information that you're you're mentioning, Jennifer. It has all the state laws and rules from TEA, has national resources, has wellness policy information, and we have over 300 and something members now, and I think over 200 different districts are represented. We only send out information around policy changes or something that directly relates to shacks. You don't have to be a member to join and you know, or and you can go to the website anytime and look up information, talk about what is the school wellness policies, um, the laws, different resources. We have three one pagers, one that targets legislators about shacks, one for existing members that aren't clear what a shack should be doing and one that helps you recruit parents. So this is just some of the information. AgriLife Extension and United Healthcare helped us put that together. Our goal was to try to get some trainings uh, developed and videotaped and then uploaded to our website. So there's more there for people to review. And then um, I also added just some general uh, Shack Guide, Texas Education Agency, and then some of the national databases and websites that can be helpful if you want to learn more about school health and then there's our information so so hopefully if you didn't see it on this presentation you can find it on our website or you can certainly email us and we usually do anywhere from four to six webinars a year on different topics we've done mental health we've done recess we've done outdoor you know uh, the importance of outdoor um, school gardens. So uh, if you join Action for Healthy Kids on our website, we have a, a newsletter, uh, which is probably going to go to bi-monthly, where we publicize the web webinars and things like that. Or if you join the Shack Network, we also send out that kind of information through there. Yes. Michelle, can you go back to the slide that had the Texas Shack Network, Shack Network website on it? Yes, yeah. thank you. Sorry, Alice, I cut you off. No, no, I was actually, I was just going to say, I was trying to type in, I'm just not fast at typing. Um, I was trying to type in the, the Texas Shack Network. <laughs> I saw someone was looking for that. So we probably have time for one more question. In the meantime, oh. I'm going to put our um, evaluation link in the chat. Um, if you could fill out our evaluation, that would be amazing. Um, <laughs> And um, in the also while we're waiting to see if one more comes up, we do have our our annual conference for Texas Children in Nature is coming up in December. Um, we have lots of great health in school sessions at the conference, so we would love for all of you to join. There is a question here that a uh, shack told one of our yes. they could not discuss an item unless it was on the agenda. If that's the rules that they're working under and that's part of their guidelines or bylaws, they could set that up. I know some shacks have struggled with people coming in from outside and being disruptive and causing problems. Um, so they have made guidelines so that if it's not on the agenda, they can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's something that the individual districts can set up um, and and sometimes it's it's been necessary from right. my understanding. 
So I was going to say it's that sounds like um, their bylaws are set up to mimic closely the school board bylaws, because I know for most school boards, um, there's, you know, that minimal or, you know, there's you have to submit your agenda item requests in advance, et cetera. And so Michelle's right. I've also worked with some school uh, school shacks who did also have, um, and that was what they did. They said, we are following our school board rules and um, agenda items, you know, nothing can new can be brought to the table. It should have been, you know, submitted three days before or whatever to be included in the agenda. Most of them will have a public comment time. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them do it at the first of the meeting. Uh, some of them I've seen do it at the end of the meeting. Mm -hmm. And you have to sign up either in advance or like when you get there. Um, you should also be able to reach out to the shack chair and ask that they put something on the agenda yes. so, uh, so that it can be discussed if you're working on something specific that you want to share out with the, with the shack. And there again, there is value if you have a chair and a co-chair um, because I know I work closely with my our um, chair who is a school it's actually our school nurse but the two of us come together before um, any shack meetings and work together to have an agenda and if I've had parents come to me about something I can share it and we make sure that our agenda is reflective of any concerns that have come up since our last meeting. Well, it is three o'clock. Um, thank you so much, Alice and Michelle, for this webinar. It was um, really great. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time. As I said, everyone, we will be sending out the recording in the coming days. Um, please feel free to share it out to anyone who you, while you've been watching this, you've thought, you know who should be here? This person, because um, I know we always have those thoughts. Um, but thank you, everyone, and have a fantastic rest of your afternoon and try to spend some time outside. Thank Amen. you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Enjoy this cool weather. Yes, beautiful weather. Mm -hmm.